Okay, uh, I'm just going to pick up where you left off in a way, um, because we've had much effort by many organisations, not, not only public health organisations, but others, uh, voluntary organisations, trying to persuade people to walk more, to take more healthy activity on a daily basis, cycle. Uh, we've got some of the most interesting uh, voluntary groups pursuing that in the country, some of them based here even. Um, yet, the overall amount of walking and cycling is not increasing. We, have a, we are still a highly car-dependent country. Um, and any new development that you see, whether it be in town or out of town, doesn't seem to compensate for this. There's still um, the same pattern going on. You can find variety, of course, some places which are, are much more walking and cycling based than others. But overall, by comparison with what we can observe in many cities in Europe, we've, we're nowhere. Now, why is that? And I'm not going to talk about this at any great length, because I want to focus in a moment on the, housing, the big housing issue. But just to say that um, if we look at what's happened in Europe, then we have to take a completely different approach, which is very unlikely with this current government, unfortunately. And I want to highlight one kind of measure which could act as a kind of political reward for, for politicians who start working in the positive direction, as all say they want to. They all claim to be on the side of healthy activity and so on. Um, and it's something which is derived from Finland, where they identify three layers of a city, what you might call the car city, which extends way out into the, uh, to the hinterland of the city where basically people are 70 or 80 or even 90% car dependent, but also the suburbs where they may still be highly car dependent. Then there's the transit city, which is much more limited. If you're looking at transit, by buses, trams and so on, which provide you with a, um, a good service, an ample service to get more or less where you want to, that's quite a limited part even of a big city like Bristol. But you can identify that by measurement and then there's the walking city. We might talk about cycling, but let's focus on walking. The walking city, which is that within uh, what you might take as a kilometre of safe routes into a main centre, a main centre of activity. You look at these, these, and if you can identify them, as it's not difficult technically to do, uh, the aspiration then is to progressively push them out. So every decision, whether it be a small incremental decision, on the, you know, through an application, a planning application, or an investment by an education or a health department, or a transport investment, or whether it be a big major development of a, of a new urban extension or whatever, that each one is judged according to this very simple model. And if the politicians see it as a, you know, ah, we've been successful, we've extended the walking city by building this new bridge across the river or we've done, some, we've done something to actually extend it, so that people have the option, and often in this country they don't, to walk, cycle, and use public transport for their general journeys, which has benefits in climate change as well as health. Now, I want to concentrate briefly on housing. And we, we are very conscious we have a housing issue in this, in this country. And just to highlight the problem. This is, I hope, hope you can see it from the back. What's happened in terms of the number of dwellings, dwellings, modern houses, I mean, um, which have been constructed over these, gen over these decades? And it's quite remarkable, really. The line goes, in terms of decades, the line is like this. That's the 70s and the 60s, I should say. 300 plus thousand. In the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, and up to roughly 2007, 8, it's around 200,000. What do you think it is now? It is, it is there. That's not just the result of the recession, it's also the result of government policy at the same time as they're claiming to want to construct more housing. So, 
the big question is, why is that happening? Why are we failing now to construct enough housing and therefore creating all the problems which we are very much aware of, of unaffordability, of just lack of housing so people are not able to move out from their parents when they want to, or all kinds of things which, le which, f which flow from that. And health and housing are intimately connected, housing quality and availability, and location. People being forced to live far, far out, say take London or even part Bath, something like that, forced to live miles and miles away from where their connections are, where their work might be, where their uh, other family members might be, and thus again exacerbating the problem of, of climate change. So I'll leave it as, because Marcus is a very stern um, <laughs> driver of this, of this process, um, I know him very well. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll leave it at that, because we can come back to, okay, well, what's going wrong exactly, and what can we do about it in questions. Thank, thanks. Thanks.